This is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. Because of the ever-present camera phone, it's often said that now everyone is a photographer. But just because it's easier for anyone to take a well-exposed and relatively sharp photograph doesn't mean that they are doing anything more than pressing a button. Just knowing how to work a microwave doesn't qualify you as a cook. The art of making photographs is rooted in the mind of a photographer who's made any number of choices well before he or she has even raised the camera to their eye. It's easy to forget that though it takes the slightest pressure to take a picture, the heavy lifting involves those moments before and after the capturing of the photograph. Few photographers know that as well as Gary Nichols, whose personal project, The Imaginarium, involves intensive and exhaustive preparation and countless hours compositing images. Rooted in his passion for steampunk, he creates more than just singular images of people in elaborate costumes and complex props. He imbues these images with a story as detailed and as rich as anything found in a novel. So when I then do a photo shoot, we sit down and I talk about their character. I tell them who they are. Now, what you've got to remember is that steampunks in general are very used to being photographed because every event you go to, that's what people do all the time. But they're posing. I don't do that. I get them to act out the scene and I take multiple shots of them when they're actually playing the part, acting the full scene out that I give them in my mind. They develop that character. Uh, we have a, sometimes we, we even have a, a, a sort of conference about, well, actually, would that character really do that? You know, because they start to get into it. Um, and then they, for that short period of time that is a photo shoot, um, they will be that person for that day in their head. So to get the 150 images for the first book, I ended up taking eight and a half thousand pictures. His passion, if not obsession, for his ever evolving story has led to collaborations with people that embody his characters, but it's also led him to travel the world to capture the backdrops against which his saga unfolds. I've had to learn all the techniques to create the images. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's an image called the Screaming Tree, which is basically a tree of women, screaming women. Now, I thought I would model that on an existing tree. So I photographed the tree, I photographed the women in a studio, um, and then used displacement mapping to overlay their skin with uh, bark texture, and I put them all together as the tree that I had photographed didn't work. In fact, I built that tree 31 times before I was happy with it because the only way that it really worked is if I actually built what I could see in my mind. And the background for that image is Yosemite uh, in, in America um, because again, I knew what the setting was I, uh, I went all over, I did uh, all of Utah and um, uh, all right around the Grand Canyon, right up to San Francisco, all taking images that I knew at some point would make their way into, uh, into the story. We'll talk to Gary about the moment where his love of photography and steampunk were simultaneously born and the extraordinary lengths he goes to create his images and produce his phenomenal prints and one-of-a-kind books. And later, I'll talk to you about the role of uncertainty in my own creative life. Welcome to The Candid Frame. Um, well, Gary, welcome to The Candid Frame. It's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, your images are fascinating. The amount of work that's involved in producing those things are, are nothing short of extraordinary, and we certainly want to get into that. But I thought a good place to start would be to sort of define what steampunk is, because even though I'm familiar with it, and you certainly are, there are a lot of people who may not be. And since your your photographs revolve around that, that genre, uh, I mm. thought it would be good to sort of explain to people what 
exactly steampunk is? I think generally it, uh, there's a lot of people who have got their own ideas of what steampunk is. It came from a throwaway remark by an author who uh, was a diesel punk writer, a cyberpunk writer, and he just threw away this remark and people actually thought, you know what, that sounds great. And that's what drew me to it is the Victorian dress with gadgets and the gadgets are amazing. So if you think of Jules Verne, mm-hmm. uh, that's a really classic way of thinking about uh, steampunk. And there are films like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen uh, with Sean Connery, for example, that were uh, sort of steampunk films. But Victorian dress with uh, mechanical, amazing gadgets is is really how I would sum it up because that's what that's what drew me to it. Yeah, it's 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 something that I've, I've had a fascination with, and to further sort of flush that out, it's the idea of what a what if question. So, what if in mm. Victorian times you had access to some of the technology that exists today, but it wasn't designed and manufactured in the very same ways? I mean, yeah. steampunk. The name itself sort of designates this, the idea that you know steam technology was really the, a, a large force during that period of time, but mm. it just takes it a bit further and thinks about, well, how about if they had computers there or they had time machines or they had mm. any sort of imaginable gadget that we have today or t- mm. still don't have today, but reimagined. Yeah. And I think that that mashup between the two is a real fascinating one in terms of just the the literature and films. One of my favorite shows used to be the Wild Wild West. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back in the sixties, early seventies, and that's mm-hmm. before there wasn't such thing as steampunk. But that sensibility is sort of perfectly encapsulated yeah. in that show. But tell me about how you got introduced to that world and how you started combining an interest in photography with what really is sort of a, a, a popular, I don't know what the, what, the, what the proper word for it is. It's, you know, what people are dressing up. You know, people talk about cosplay, but that's completely something different. This is, yeah, completely. This, this, yeah. this is something else. I, what's the proper name for, for that? <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because generally with, if you were to class it as a genre, there would be music associated with it. So, you know, with goths, there are music associated with, et cetera, et cetera. But there isn't with steampunk. There is no music that started that sort of culture off. Generally, people that are within the community that they refer it to uh, refer to it as a steampunk community rather than a particular thing, more of a lifestyle type thing. In that, and the only rule there is only one rule, and the one one rule of steampunk is to be splendid. In other Mm. words, be very well-mannered, be nice to people, and uh, generally be a, a nice person. A shame that there's not more steampunks in the world for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, that generally is it. But it is completely about creativity. It's about, as you quite rightly said, taking something, mashing it up, coming up with an idea. And uh, a lot of the talks that I do, I, my talk is called uh, Reality is for People with No Imagination. And that's mm. the thing. The whole, the whole thing about what I'm actually doing is about letting your imagination run free. Rather than saying that you've got to think outside the box, if you think there is a box, already too late. Oh, wow. <laughs> so the reality is nothing, the only thing that uh, confines me, if you like, is my ability with a camera and Photoshop. And so I'm constantly thinking of images that will push me further and further to try and understand how to create what the uh, what the actual image is that I see in my mind, because that, that's where it all starts. It starts as a finished picture in my head. I go wherever I need to in the world to photograph all the elements to then come back and build that image. But tell me about that first gathering that you went to where you got introduced mm. to that world, because that was the catalyst for, for all of this. Yeah. So uh, Photoshop Creative Magazine uh, in 2012, I bought that and there was an article on how to create a steampunk image. And you took a beautiful model and you put bits of cogs and trains and all sorts on her and there you go, you've got a steampunk uh, image. And I just thought there surely must be people that do this for real. 
Google is your friend when things are like that uh, coming up. So I managed to find the Lincoln Steampunk Festival called The Asylum, which is run by two people initially, which is uh, John Naylor and Karen Grover. They started it, started it 10 years ago. I think 450 people came. It's now the world's largest steampunk festival, and they have a whole team called the Ministry of Steampunk that, that put that on. So I bought two tickets. It's in the old town of Lincoln in uh, in the UK, and seven to ten thousand steampunks and one hundred twenty thousand people take over the whole of the old town for four days over a bank holiday in this uh, in this country, and it is sensational. So that uh, that's when I went there. I thought, okay, this is what I've been looking for for a small little project. I was thinking maybe of just six little pictures uh, put together just you know in my head I had an idea and one of them is uh, is called When We Dance Angels Run and Hired which the sting song of that name gave me the idea for the picture that very first picture came from going to the asylum to that um, event I met two people there Peter Walton who is now he, he now plays the main character in my story Dr. William but he makes all the props. So all the amazing steampunk gadgets in my story, Peter makes them and they all work and they have to work because that's his thing. And his wife, Julie, who plays Eva uh, in the story as well, she does the costuming. So the three of us basically had a photo shoot, came up with the first picture and then we said, you know what, I think we've got a story here. And the thing that sort of drove me on with that you can go and buy a fine art book. It'll have 60 pictures in it. It'll cost you £150. That's it. That's all it was, 60 pictures. And I just thought, why can't this be a story? So the last person that actually did that was Hogarth with Rake's Progress in 1540, whatever. No one's done it before. And what started off as six or seven pictures is now a 450 image trilogy. So the... <laughs> The first book I finished 18 months, two years ago, it's a 30 centimetre, so 12 inch square book, weighs two and a half kilo. But the one thing with my work is uh, it's printed on uh, aluminium. So that gives a specific look to my images. I needed to replicate that in the book. So they're all, they've all been spot varnish, which is an expensive progress, which meant the book became a 1,000 copy limited edition only, and there won't be any more after each each uh, one of the trilogies done. So on average, that first book took me four years. The second one will, will have been three years, but comes out next summer. There are 150 steampunks involved, and this is the the uh, this is the best bit for me. The final book, I'm travelling around the world to photograph 4,000 steampunks from as many countries as I can visit to build one huge Lord of the Rings style battle scene image for the final book. Yeah. So I think that's probably six months work in one picture. And when people take a look at the photographs, they'll have a small inkling of all the effort yeah. that, that goes on to it because you, you've gone to incredible lengths in order to create the photographs. But I, I want to get back to this whole idea of, of, of the story because you know, you've talked about that in terms of the images, you already have a, a complete idea in terms of what they will look like. You're not working from mm. sketches. You're not, you know, you have an idea in terms of what you want to create. But a big part of the photographs, especially the the series of photographs, is that it's about a narrative. And yes. and it, from what I've read, it seems like it's a collaboration between you and the people who who are these characters because you don't hire yeah. just pretty pretty models dress them up like you know, steampunkers so these so these people are working with you in order to portray the characters in your photographs but also shape the story um, is that yeah, right so so yeah so uh, i interesting for me when i see somebody in, a, in an amazing costume a whole character forms in my mind i know everything about them i know how many kids they've got I know where they were born I know what life they've I knew, know what they do for a job all of that story comes to me when I see that person and then I approach them and ask them if they would like to be in the Imaginarium so when I then do a photo shoot we sit down and I talk about their character I tell them who they are now 
What you've got to remember is that steampunks in general are very used to being photographed because mm -hmm. every event you go to, that's what people do all the time. But they're posing. I don't do that. I get them to act out the scene and I take multiple shots of them when they're actually playing the part, acting the full scene out that I give them in my mind. They develop that character. Uh, we have a, sometimes we, we even have a sort of a conference about, well, actually, would that character really do that? You know, because they start to get into it. And then they, for that short period of time that is a photo shoot, they will be that person for that day in their head. So to get the 150 images for the first book, I ended up taking eight and a half thousand pictures to get, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so that gave me, uh, because, uh, and I shoot tethered to a laptop, uh, because then I take some shots, we all gather around the laptop and I talk about no look. This is what I was really looking for. This is what I want you to do. So in a sense, I'm kind of directing a film mm -hmm. in, the, in that same in that sense but the uh, what I would say about it is there's a lot of people who know me I would not know them if I if I wasn't doing this it's brought a whole new world to me it's completely changed my outlook on people who do things like this uh, I'm now fully fledged steampunk myself I, I've got a uh, half a wardrobe full of different clothes uh, because it draws you in uh, sucks you into the into it because it's just so creative but by the same token you know I'll go to uh, Liechtenstein because there's a group of people in Liechtenstein that are uh, steampunks that are absolutely outstanding and their costumes are very European and very different to British by the same token that American steampunks are different to British so it's nice to bring different cultures into it and also uh, learn about how they create their their own uh, costumes and gadgets and stuff and it is that that's the whole it, that's what's important to me about it actually and, and the gadgets themselves are just absolutely amazing i've i've gone to mm -hmm. i haven't gone to a steampunk convention but i've i've seen some of the craftsmen who make these intricate intricate uh, devices and as you said they they're working Right, they may not have that yeah. magical quality that 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 you know that uh, is imagined around these devices, but they're functioning. That they turn, they rotate, they make will make sounds, and uh, yeah. it's it's really phenomenal to see the extent that people will go to uh, in this world, not just in terms of a costume, but really sort of trying to fabricate as much of that reality in the real world. Yeah, it's quite. I mean. So Peter, who, who makes the props, there's one object which is called the necessity in my story, which is basically, it's a glowing orb that's held by solid silver hands. And when you pull a lever, the hands open. So basically, the hands are protecting the orb. Now, in my story, it, it has time traveling capabilities. It becomes very important in the second book because of what the events that happen in the book, that is the main focus of it. Now, it took him a year to make. It's worth 12,000 pounds. It's an unbelievable piece of art in its own right. But for him, it has to work. Even though I'm photographing it, it has to work. And it is absolutely outstanding because there's no, there's no electric motor, no nothing. It works on the cam. You pull a lever and the arms open ex really slowly. So I photographed that in all different positions. The interesting part for me, I knew I could create the pictures, write in the story, whole nother ball game, uh, because I haven't written anything since I was at school, and that was a long time ago. Mm. So it, it became quite difficult, if you like, to... The, the images in the first book generated the story. The second book, I've had to write that, because it's about seven kids who go back in time from present day. I don't want an 18-year-old Harry Potter in my story. I, I need the kids to be the same age throughout the second book so mm -hmm. I've got to write the story and then have two weeks of doing all the, all the photography so it, I need that because it's so therefore it's different because 
I, the story is now generating the images, whereas the images generated the story in the first book. So let me, let me get this right. So for that first book, the entire story was just in your head and you just verbalized yeah. it to the people who you photographed yeah. it. But the second time you're actually having to put words on a page. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How, or, how, or how is it different? Um, well, uh, so the temptation when you write is to write all about one character right to the end and then go back and write about the next one, which is not how books are written. Although, to be fair, I've read a couple lately that are written that way, but that's not generally the story needs to flow. So the way that I worked was to put the image into a Excel spreadsheet on one row, write the story that related to that, do that for all 150 odd pictures, and then move the rows around so the story flows. So I'm moving the pictures and the, and the element of the story that goes with the picture, I'm moving it up and down in the spreadsheet to then get the story to flow properly, which is exactly what happened. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you're a man who really enjoys making their life very complicated. Uh, well, it, it, it's the only way. I, um, you know, I'm, I'm a problem solver, uh, uh, and it's the way that I worked out that I could get it to work and, it, and what it does is it also highlights where an element of the story is wrong so it makes it jump out so for instance dr william in the story creates this amazing piece this necessity that's time traveling etc etc he's a doctor and an inventor how did the necessity get the magic in it to enable it to time travel well that didn't occur to me till i was well into the book and i thought well now i've got to create a whole backstory just to explain how that has now got magic powers. Mm -hmm. Needed another character. I had to go back and create a whole big story about Dr. William's wife died, he couldn't save her. The elven queen saves him, he takes the orb to her to get the magic in it, all to just explain that one thing because someone would read it, look at the story and go, oh yeah, how's that got yeah. magic? Well, when, you, when you're going in that deep and you're going into something with that level of detail, your photographs are going to reflect that. Mm. And, and as a result, there are going to be, have to be things in that photograph that tie in to the narrative. But what you're doing is you're compositing. You, you certainly have the characters, but then you also have to have the setting. You also have to have the props. You yeah. also, you yeah. know, there are all these things that you absolutely have to have. Your images reflect locations all over the, all over the world because you've done a lot of traveling. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. guess you did it specifically for the photographs, is that right? Yes. Uh, let's just say that I, I kind of dictate where we go on holiday. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, I've just, for the second book, I've actually just come back from um, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam because I wanted the Angkor Wat temples I, with the trees growing out of the temple. I wanted all of that in my second book i've got a whole range of uh, the story that is around that and the difficulty was is i was having to wait for people to disappear and leave me on my own so that i could get the photograph that i wanted and i know there is a facility in photoshop if you're using a tripod and you take multiple images and people are moving photoshop will take all those people out for you but i just wanted to wait it did end up with my wife saying to me we've been away for 16 days and i've seen you for two but mm. that's you know uh, but but you you know the thing about this is if you've got something inside you that you really want to do life's too short you have to you have to be a bit selfish and you have to do it and for me firstly all the people in my story i am immortalizing them they will be there forever. And secondly, I'm leaving behind a series of uh, uh, fine art images that people will have forever because my printing on the metal, they are uh, you know good for 150 years or whatever. They are they are amazing. And that was another thing for me, which once I had my first image printed on metal, I never went back to paper because. One of the things that the way I work is I create depth and it's difficult to see that on a computer screen. But once they're printed on metal, because I know the printing process and what they actually do to do that, I build that in to my images. So take, take my street scene, for example. There's 150 people in that shot. 
There's 37 buildings from all over the UK to build that street. 600 hours work, that image. Now, to create the depth, if you look in, if you look across into the distance, all the buildings and trees and everything else in the distance slightly faded in colour, primarily because there are water droplets between you and the furthest object. So I have to put those in. I have to put layers of water droplets in to the image to create the depth because I don't use depth of field. I, every single thing in every one of my pictures is absolutely in focus and it's heavily detailed because that's what I'm known for. So I, I, rather than a photographer using depth of field to get you to look where they want you to in, a, in an image, I use light. So my images are detailed corner to corner, but I use light in the same way that Caravaggio and Vermeer used light. I effectively replicate what they used to do with a paintbrush, but I do it with a camera. Yeah, and that's one of the phenomenal things about your, your work is how aware you are of, of light. Because a, a composite can easily fall apart if mm. the photographer is just like, you know, grabbing a piece here, grabbing a piece here and forcing them together. Mm. Even though the casual viewer may look at a picture and may not understand that, they'll get an innate sense that there's just something wrong right yes and yeah. but, but with your picture you can look at it and it's like it, it's phenomenal i looked at, i just look at how you use light not just for your subjects for but for the setting and the objects and it's just like mm. <laughs> i keep saying it's exhausting because I, I i can't help but think of everything that's involved because you just mentioned how many hours for that big uh street shot yeah. that, you, that you did and there's yeah, uh, well, there's, there's the thing about that too is there's 14 layers to every person before they go in the picture. And then there's three layers of shadow to every person. So uh, I lost count of 2,000 layers, to be honest. It's, it's a huge uh, Photoshop file. But you didn't have this skill set when you first started. So it was, no. you just basically have learned as you've gone along, right? Yeah, so the, the trick with Photoshop, first of all, I went to, I went to a, a, a one-off tutorial day from uh, Glyn Dewis, who's a, who's, a, mm -hmm. who's a retoucher. And I went to his and I thought, okay, I, I studied, I was a graphics uh, teacher uh, a long time ago. So, and I used to do pen and ink drawings. So actually using a tablet and a pen is, uh, is quite intuitive actually. But I went to his tutorial today to uh, his tutorial day and thought this is what I've been looking for this is what I've been this is how I can put what I've got in my head into reality and he he basically taught me uh, those basic skills and and I I then learnt every time and this is the this is the thing with Photoshop you don't try and learn it all you only learn what you need to learn to create the picture that you're working on and the one thing that Glenn Dewis told me, which I always do, is all the processes that I've used, I just write them down in a book because at a later date, and I think, how the hell did I do that? I can actually go back mm. and look it up. So he were, he started me off on this uh, journey, uh, for want of a better word. But from that moment on, it's a way I've had to learn all the techniques to create the images. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's an image called the screaming tree, which is basically a tree of women, screaming women. Now, I thought I would model that on an existing tree. So I photographed the tree, I photographed the women in a studio, and then used displacement mapping to overlay their skin with uh, bark texture, and I put them all together as the tree that I had photographed. Didn't work. In fact, I built that tree 31 times before I was happy with it because mm. the only way that it really worked is if I actually built what I could see in my mind. And the background for that image is Yosemite uh, in, in America because, again, I knew what the setting was. I, uh, I went all over. I did uh, all of Utah and um, all right around the Grand Canyon, right up to San Francisco, all taking images that I knew at some point would make their way into uh, into the story. So uh, that's why that's why, when you say I've been all over the world, I have because I know what I'm looking for, and there are only certain places in the world that match what, what you know what I see. 
effectively. We'll talk a little bit about equipment here because one of the things I'm curious about is that when you use different lenses to capture different scenes, like you know the overall scene or the portrait or the detail shot, you're dealing with a different rendering of each subject and object as a result of the, the optical nature of, of the lens. Does that complicate what you have to do in any way? No, so a lot of composite guys will say you need to use the same lens for every part of the shot to get it to look right. That's not true because Photoshop actually has a section where you tell it, you click on a button that says, that knows which lens you've used and it sorts it out for you. So basically, you go into uh, that section, you click on the, um, uh, the little uh, box that says that you wanna, uh, want it to recognize the lens. It knows that you've used a f2.8 200mm Canon. It knows exactly what you've used, and it basically it flattens the image back, takes all the dis- distortion out, which allows you actually to use not only different lenses, but also different cameras. It's quite it's quite clever and it is it's a brilliant part that never used to be in photoshop and i can understand why people used to use the same lens so that they didn't get the sort of kind of distortion that you're talking about but i don't have that issue well what's the camera that you're using and 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 why and why so, did you yeah, think? a canon 5d uh, mark IV, but i've got uh, the l lenses it's it will always be the case that spend the money on the lens. I only use the, uh, I've only recently upgraded to the foot mark four because of the extra sensor megapixel that, you know, gives me that, you know, you've got to bear in mind that I'm photographing elements and not a scene. Mm -hmm. So also, I mean, one thing, if you look at that street scene, uh, you could spend a long time looking at it. You'll see something different in it every time you do, because there's so much going on. But if you were to go and take a picture of a street, there's probably always going to be one person who spots the cameraman. Mm -hmm. Think about the news uh, items that go on. There's always someone waving in the background, someone being silly. Well, in in that image, there's one person being silly because he's the only person spotted the cameraman. It's deliberate. He's actually on the run. He's, he's, uh, <laughs> he's being framed for killing his wife. He's on the run and he's basically saying, look at me, I'm right here, right in the middle. So hiding in plain sight. So, you know. But this is not the way you make, make a living, right? You have a no, real world no, I, job. I do, right? I do. And yeah. a lot of people who enjoy photography, one of the things they always complain about is just not having enough time to do something that they love. <laughs> you have so much time that you have to dedicate to making these photographs. How do you manage that? I mean, do you have do you have to be incredibly organized in order to make this happen? Uh, does, does it come in like, you know, stops and starts in terms of working on an individual image, or are you working on multiple images simultaneously? No, I, I mean, the thing about uh, doing images that take a long time is you have to have a break because it's the same, I had a band for, and a recording studio for 20 odd years. You have to, if you're mixing music, you have to take a break. Your ears become used to what you're listening to and therefore you don't hear half of what you're trying to mix. It's exactly the same when you're putting images together in Photoshop. You miss things. And if you don't have a break and come back to it and then look again, you actually don't see them because your brain tends to block those out when you're constantly working on stuff. So the street scene uh, was over a period of time. I went, I just kept going back to it, back to it, back to it. Some of the other images though, I will work on them until I finish them. So I I do uh, 40 hours a week on my day job because I run a sustainability company. That's my, that's my day job. And, but I do another 40 hours a week on the Imaginarium on top of that. So people, ask me if I sleep <laughs> not very often but the main the main reason they ask me that is because of all these things that are going around in my head all the time so one of the things that uh, it's excitement though so if you're passionate about something and you come up with a new idea the first thing you want to do is is start it first thing you want to do is see how it's going to work out I don't I don't sketch anything because I don't need to because I see that image finished the difficulty is when you then have to try and find the elements that match what you actually see. And sometimes 
if I can't find the right background, I will build the background that I want. So the airship image, for instance, that's 15 different sections of coastline put together to create that bay because that's how I wanted it to look. So I did a five mile walk in Catalonia, which is where I, that's the coastline I wanted uh, in Greece shot images out to sea and then come back and put the bay together that matched the image that I wanted to create. And someone made that dirigible? No, that's the, in the, in the whole story, that is the only thing that's not real. But for my second book, someone has made one. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I can legitimately say in the next book, everything will be real. But that's, uh, so Cinema 4D is uh, Photoshop 3D, uh, is, a, is a light version of Cinema 4D. So that's the, um, that's the thing. I mean, the thing about this too is it will be a film. When I finish this, it will be a film. I've had 18 approaches so far, uh, and we're talking about uh, talking to Netflix about TV series actually, because it's so complex. There are 42 characters that you're following through this story. It's so complex that I think a film would lose too much because they'd have to cut so much out. But the whole reason why so far I've not said yes to anybody is because I don't want my story changed until I've finished it. So, it, you know, I know where it's going. It gets very complex. I've got a time-travelling serial killer on the loose in the second book. It gets really dark and very complex. And I, I don't want it changed just because someone would say, well, we might that might be a bit difficult to uh, to film in those sequences, etc. So I think that's why it probably lends itself much more to a TV series than, than a film, so that it stays true. Of the real-world elements that you've included in, in your photographs, which was the most difficult and thus the most gratifying one to get? I'd say probably the street was the most complex. And the reason why it was the most difficult is... You've got to photograph the buildings from the right place to get the perspective right. And that isn't easy because especially if you're standing in the middle of the street and there's cars going <laughs> up and down, you know, you know what building you're looking for. You know exactly where you want it to go in the image, but you can't until you sit down at the screen and put it in place. You don't know if you you've taken it from the right place. Hmm. So actually putting all those images together for that uh, was probably the most gratifying. However, the most difficult one is probably the straightest shot in the whole book, which is uh, an image of Dr. William making the necessity, which was taken by candlelight. And that was a very difficult image to do because obviously I didn't want it to be grainy. So I didn't want the ISO to be too high because it would have been a grainy shot. I didn't want that. And obviously, Dr. William needed to be still for that to work. Mm -hmm. So experimented with loads of different ways of actually getting it to um, work. And finally, the answer was to shoot it by candlelight, but use a small um, snoot off of a gold reflector to lift the candle enough that I didn't, it didn't become a grainy image. But the image I wanted to create with that was a Bob Cratchit feel from uh, Christmas Carol, De Charles Dickens. I wanted that feel that he's sitting at his workbench, at his uh, table, and instead of doing the accounts uh, for Ebenezer Scrooge, he's making this um, necessity. That was the whole idea, the image that came to mind. And it, effectively, um, that, was the, that was the shot. These, these these images are collected in in the book, and mm. you were approached at one point about you know publishing them, but you weren't really satisfied with what the publisher wanted to do, and so you've went on pretty much on your own so that you could have complete control over it. And as a result, from what I've heard, it it really looks remarkable. But talk, talk to us about you know having to make that decision and how doing it the way that you're doing it now really serves your vision of the project. What's important for me is, firstly, I've got 150 people that I'm photographing for this, and I need to do them justice. They spend a long time creating their costumes. They've given their time up to come and be in this. So I need to do them justice. Now, that's the first thing. The second thing is, 
publishers, they were going to do 5,000 copies, but they were, they were just going to print it at sort of magazine quality. Now, that does not reflect my work. It doesn't look, it's not good enough. And also, I wanted to produce something that would be a collector's edition and, an, and essentially something that, that when, it, when it arrives in the post, your first instinct is, I need a pair of white gloves. Mm. I need some white gloves to open this book. So the detail we've gone to with the book is every single page, the, cut, the background color was hand mixed. It was printed by a four million pound machine in Liverpool by Fine Print. They printed it. I was up there all night watching it come off the print. It quite uh, amazing. But then each image was then spot UV varnished to match. So it matches my metal print look. The publishers basically said, um, there is no way that <laughs> we could do this. We would never make any money. And I said, well, there's no way that I'm going to allow it to be published any other way. So I'll do it myself. So I did a Kickstarter. I needed £65,000 to print 1,000 copies. I didn't make my target, which means you don't get your uh, money with mm -hmm. Kickstarter. You don't hit the target. But all but 50 people that had pledged, I, I opened up a pre-order page on my website and they pre-ordered it, which actually got me, it didn't get me the money I was looking for. It, it, was, it was a good bit short, but at least it got me enough to actually say, okay, I can now... Uh, I can now print it. The beauty of it is, is because there's only a thousand, they become rare. So I've, so I've built something into it because I, um, I've kind of, I've, I'm looking at this, what would you do if you were a collector? And if someone said to you, um, okay, you've got number, you've got book number 25, and because you've bought, bought book number one, you get to keep number 25, that's yours. So the next two volumes of the trilogy have got the numbers 25 are yours. So you end up with a proper collection. Hmm. That for me was vital because if I was a collector, that's what I would want. I would want to make sure that I got the same number. Um, and so it's leather bound. It weighs two and a half kilo. It all became about the quality of the book. This will never, I will never make money out of this. It's not about that. It's not about money and it never has been. It's about producing a beautiful piece of work that, that I am proud to say that I've, I've actually done that. Yeah. And what's fascinating about, about it, the people who are purchasing the prints and, and the book is not all of them are people who are into steampunk. No, no, no. 75% of the people that have bought my prints and uh, book are just members of the public, art collectors. They're just just people this is not people often say do you need to be into steampunk to get it well no you don't because it's a story you don't have to be into uh, Star Wars to enjoy the film you know it's a story and that's that's the whole thing it's a it's a complex a pretty dark story because it's Dickens style but the costuming and gadgets are steampunk and I think also Instead of taking steampunk to a totally unbelievable direction, actually, I've kept it so it is believable. I've kept it so that you genuinely believe that Dr. William has made this object. The wings that the, uh, the two steampunk angels wear, again, they took months to make, uh, but they work. You pull a lever and the wings come up. They are laser cut stainless steel. They're, they're amazing sets of wings. But uh, I'll tell you something interesting about that. So the two steampunk angels, I always wanted to create an image where they are sitting on a wall on the top of the Rockefeller Center in New York with the Empire State Building in the background. I, that was an image I had at twilight, purple sky, mm -hmm. purple Empire State Building, etc. So I found that Empire State is purple, and I know I could have done this in Photoshop, that's not the point. <laughs> The Empire State's purple the week before Christmas because it's Hanukkah. So booked a little trip with my wife to uh, go to uh, New York for the for three or four days. Bought a twilight ticket to go up the Rockefeller Center to take my uh, my image. I didn't realize that there was sort of 
500 people up there at the same time. It was a little bit crowded. Also didn't realize that it was just glass. So I had to clean a section of glass and put my lens right on it to take the image of the Empire State. They're actually sitting on the a wall from the Gaudi house in Barcelona because that's the wall that I wanted. But then I couldn't work out how this was going to fit into the story until somebody said to me, yes, but with steampunk, there's time travel. So they, because the Empire State is Art Deco, it wouldn't fit in Victorian. So I've had them come forward in time because they uncovered a kidnap plot that's going on in the past. Because they're having a chat in the future, no one can overhear them what they're actually plotting to do. So that was how I built it in. But oh, I really wanted to do that picture because I just <laughs> saw that image and I thought, how, I don't know how this is going to fit, but it does. It seems like half the fun for you is like you you basically paint yourself into a corner and it's like, yeah. how do I figure this out? Whether it's yeah. with the story or with the creation of the images, it seems like that constant challenge is what fascinates you, not just the creation of the, the photographs. Yeah, it is. It's also understanding how you get the best from people. It's understanding that, and also people do say to me, uh, well, some of your, your, well, most of your models just seem like ordinary people. Well, that's because they are, because this is what this is about. This is about people, about people who enjoy being steampunks, enjoy that creativity. It's about them. This is never about uh beautiful models with steampunk clothes on. Hmm. And that's my, my one rule of the whole project is, I don't care who you are, you could be uh, Miss World for all I care. Uh, if you're not steampunk, you can't be in it because that's, I can genuinely say that everybody that's in my story is a genuine steampunk. There's one guy, Montague Jacques Fromage, from <laughs> New York. <laughs> yeah, he's a steampunk rapper. Absolutely amazing guy, quite old, flies all around the world uh, doing what they call chap rap, emailed me to say, I'd really love to be on your story. And I saw his outfit, saw his look, said, great. Well, he flies over for the shoots. So he, that's the thing. I have to have a connection with the person that I see. There has to be a connection. Sometimes I'll see someone that looks good, but if I can't, the character doesn't come to me. I won't use them. Mm. You know, it has to be, there has to be that two-way thing. And so getting the best out of people, you have to be familiar with them and so that they can relax enough. And that's another thing that I always do. I tell everybody to completely relax and then I count them in. So I say, right, one, two, on the third count, go into the action. Because then they're, they're not standing there for ages looking at the camera and wondering whether you're going to press the button or not. Mm. They're actually, you're counting them in. They know when it's going to happen. They're ready for it and they can actually do what you want them to do. Uh, often I've been on photo shoots where I've seen photographers, the model's standing there in a pose because he hasn't said he's taken the picture and he'll be fiddling around with his lens and changing something else. And she's looking, thinking, well, has he taken it? Am I doing the right thing? So you need that interaction. It's, 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 this is much more about the people in my pictures rather than me creating it. It's mm. much more about them. And, and, and that's the whole idea of it, to be yeah. fair. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Um, who would that one photographer be? I would say, her name has gone right out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> I came across her and I'm, I'm probably going to have to look her up because her name's gone totally out of my head completely. But she photographs mermaids. So basically, she's got a swimming pool and she goes underwater and she photographs these amazing mermaids and then builds the most amazing fine art image from the shots that she takes. You've probably, you've, you may well have uh, spoken to the other one, that is uh, that was a big influence on me too and that's jill greenberg who um oh yeah yeah so she the reason that she was an influence on me is because she uses a ring flash to photograph baboons or dogs or anything with hair i use a ring flash whenever i photograph somebody who's got a beard because of her so there's a another um but i might have to uh 
look up the other woman I'm talking about and send you a link and then you can uh, you can get in touch yeah, with her. Because I'll include her, it in the show notes for people to check out. Her work is is phenomenal. Oh, Gary, thank you so much. I really, yeah. It was really so thank much fun to much. talk with you. Thanks. Each week, we have a segment on the show where I share thoughts, ideas, and memories that may or may not involve photography. We call it The Last Frame. I recently posted a question on the Candid Frame Facebook page about what's your greatest challenge when it comes to photography. I received a variety of responses, including struggles with finding enough time to practice photography, becoming better editors of one's own work, or concerns about endlessly repeating oneself and not growing and changing. I related to all of those responses that people posted, as many of those same issues are ever present in my own creative life. Because no matter how long I've been doing this, I'm also always questioning myself, trying to understand what the heck it is I'm doing. The word confidence was shared several times in the response to my question. And when I looked it up in the dictionary, one of the definitions for confidence described it as the quality or state of being certain. And when I thought of that definition with respect to my photography, I realized how often I'm in the pursuit of certainty. How often do I make photographs when I'm completely confident about what I'm creating? And I realized that I'm rarely creating an image with 100% certainty or confidence. There's always a degree of unpredictability, a chance in each fraction of a second that prevents me from enjoying the certitude of complete confidence. But what I do have confidence about are the different elements that lead up to that moment. I have confidence in my ability to observe light and shadow, line and shape, color and gesture. I have confidence in how I handle my camera and lens. I have confidence in my sense of timing. I have a trust in myself that I can take these various skills, strengths, and experiences and use them together to produce an interesting photograph. During such moments, I don't fixate on the things that I don't know. I don't obsess that I've never memorized the numerical values of the Kelvin temperature scale or don't work well with strobes or that my bifocals make it difficult to see through the viewfinder. Instead, I focus on those things I've proven to myself that I can rely on to make a good photograph. Because regardless of how I am feeling in any given moment, I've proven to myself countless times that there are certain things that I can do to increase the likelihood that I'll be able to pull it off. Despite what I may not know, I can stack the odds a little more in my favor by practicing what I do know that works for me. If I only made photographs when I was completely certain, I would never make an image. There is so much that happens in a moment that I have no control over. But that's the very thing that can make a photograph magical and amazing. There have been so many times when that surprise of light, gesture, or timing takes what I thought was good and transforms it into something amazing. Not because I controlled it, but because I had prepared myself for something unpredictable. As much as I desire and pursue certainty in my life and my work, the reality is that it's often the acceptance and even the embracing of the unpredictable that provides photography and life its beauty. As nervous and anxious as it can make me, the lack of certainty is necessary for me because it's surmounting the insecurities and fears related to that uncertainty that eventually lead me to the very confidence that I was seeking. And that's the last frame. Thanks to all of you who have contributed to our Patreon effort. 
So far, we are a little more than a third of the way of getting 100 new Patreon supporters for the show, and your contributions are already helping us tremendously. There are a lot of costs involved in creating and maintaining a podcast, including many reoccurring monthly and annual fees for software, file storage, and distribution, website hosting, etc. And while your contributions help us tremendously in taking care of these obligations, your donations also free me to dedicate a lot of time to delivering the best show possible each week. By becoming a Patreon supporter, You become an integral part of the podcast that brings you conversations with photographers that are unlike anything you'll hear elsewhere. When you contribute as little as $5 a month, you are ensuring that I can dedicate my time to the production of the show, which includes finding and conducting research on guests, recording interviews, writing scripts, etc. So if you haven't already, please take the time today to become a Patreon contributor for as little as $5 a month. You help to ensure that the candid frame remains an important part of your creative life. Thanks. Thanks to Gary for accepting my invitation to appear on the show. You can find out more about him and his work by visiting g-n-p.co.uk. And my follow-up to my first book, Chasing the Light, is now available for purchase. It's called Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow. And if you feel stuck or struggling with making good images on a consistent basis, this book is for you. It goes beyond the correct settings of your camera and will help you to see with a critical and creative eye. You can order the book today. When you place your order from the Rocky Nook website, use the promo code PORELLO40 to receive 40% off the list price. Check out the website and the show notes for the link. And if you want to keep up with all things Candid Frame, sign up for our mailing list and you'll receive three free copies of my previously published ebooks. And if you like what you're hearing on the show, please take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store as it helps our ranking and creates greater awareness of the show. Thanks to Crystal Saros from the U.S. for their five-star review. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon, or you can make a one-time contribution via PayPal. You'll find the links for both in the show notes and the website. Thanks to Cyril Richard, Michael Schultz, Tony Lee, and Greg Anastasi for their recent contributions. I really appreciate it. And if you want to easily access every episode of The Candid Frame, download the free Candid Frame app. It's available for both Apple iOS and Android. Download it today, and you'll find it where everything else is in the show notes on the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod whose royalty-free music can be found at Incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.